After joining the Hawaii at First Nations team at Sagsaw Hatchery in Rousseau Creek, we had a chance to ask Lands and Marine Coordinator Amelia Voss a few more questions about the work her team does, the effects of industry on salmon habitat, and the challenges facing these vitally important fish. In addition to six years of experience working for the Hawaii at Nation, Amelia has a background in the commercial marine and freshwater fishing industries, and was able to provide some fascinating and valuable insights into the projects and challenges related to salmon management in this region. Each hatchery program is based on the needs of the streams they are enhancing. Uh, we enhance two species. One is Chum from the Saksa Creek and the other is Coho, Coho from the Pachina River. The basics of the program is essentially to help ensure that more eggs survive. In the wild, it has been assessed that about 80% of eggs perish before they're even hatched. And that's based on environmental factors, predator factors, fertility factors. Um, but in the hatchery setting, about 80% survive. Two things that are super important for eggs are temperature and oxygen. Um, if either of those things uh, vary too much, the eggs will respond, sometimes negatively. Having a passionate and engaged team makes a big difference. Having people that genuinely care about the survival of your eggs and genuinely are excited when they see the fish that they've hatched returning in the next year or the next four years, depending on the species. Um, and I just find that makes a big difference on the actual outcome of your hatchery. Uh, we have nine salmon bearing streams on the Huayat territory. We have set a goal to complete an escapement survey, that's a returning salmon survey, on every one of those creeks and streams. We swim the Sarita River every week. We collect as much data as we can about all the different species returning. And then we work with our government, with DFO, and with the Nitnat Hatchery to ensure that we are identifying how much wild fish are returning versus how much hatchery fish are returning. That's super important because there is a there is a slow decrease of wild DNA in rivers right now that are being enhanced. Um, There's a huge push in the 80s to enhance rivers and um, while it was a positive move, it happened a little too fast and they didn't consider that enhanced DNA would actually weaken the wild DNA. So that's a, that's a really interesting part of the project of stream assessment. What is the purpose slash mission of the hatchery uh, in terms of conservation and restoration? The way a hatchery sets its goals is by assessing its river and st or streams and the needs of those streams. For us, um, we work with our executive council and our Hatwia council, which um, help guide us in what's important to the nation and what's important to the health of our system. For the Saksaw Creek Hatchery, it was originally a rebuilding goal, so there was few chum running into that river where traditionally there was many chum running into that river. And the Hawaii First Nations people would utilize the returning chum for food in the fall. As this system depleted and the run size shrunk, there was an initiative to rebuild that system. And so over the years, that has continued to happen and we actually are seeing quite a good run now. For the Pachina River, um, the goal was for conservation. There wasn't a great return. Traditionally there had been um, and it was so poor that the goal was to rebuild it to a healthy, healthy state where it could sustain itself. Um, traditionally and currently there isn't much catch or harvest happening in the Pachina River, um, but if we reached a reached our goal of having a sustainable uh, coho return again, we may change our goal to be, to be something different. How have the forestry practices in the watershed influenced conditions in local rivers in terms of salmon habitat? Unfortunately, historical and current forestry practices have failed to consider the importance of water systems of salmon and the habitat that support them. In historical times, in the 1940s and 1950s, um, people like to call that the cowboy era where there was very little environmental management going on and many 
creeks and streams across the entirety of the BC coast were destroyed for forestry harvest. Fortunately, there has been some change in policy and procedure and protection, and we are seeing forestry practices do better in regard to salmon bearing streams, but the long-term effects are still occurring across our territory and across the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, good examples of that include something called aggradation. You can see that when you're driving along rivers and streams where there's huge amounts of gravel or cobble built up in the middle of the river or a river has diverted itself to a new kind of path of least resistance. Um, that's, a, that's a common effect of forestry because when trees are removed from the riparian area, which is the area closest to the stream, uh, the ability for the soil stability is lost. It's lost from the root system and therefore rain and other water systems will just wash away all of the edge of the river into the river. This is difficult for salmon or it affects salmon negatively because salmon won't be able to access their spawning grounds or their spawning grounds will be changed and they won't be as a healthy of a place to make their nest lay their eggs. Um, and in some systems, what used to be a thriving fish bearing stream no longer has salmon in it because it can't be accessed. What are the biggest challenges facing salmon recovery in this region? I would say there's three big challenges and threats. And the first being climate change. It's uh, prevalent in just the six years I've been here. Fish are returning earlier. Fish are difficult to predict when they're returning. Fish are returning in smaller numbers without a viable reason. We are finding the SAR, which is sea to river survival, to be really low. So, you know, we're getting a 2% return. So say we release 500,000 fish, we're getting maybe a thousand return. And that's, that's really concerning. Um, the second thing I would say is industry, both in the commercial harvest industry, the sports fishing industry, and the natural resource extraction industry. Um, there tends to be an overarching breed that, uh, here's a good example. <laughs> there seems to be an overarching breed to uh, extract natural resources or harvest natural resources that it comes before conservation, it comes before protection and restoration, and I think before we see that change, we'll con continue to see a damage to these, these salmon stocks. And the third one is government. We continue to see the Canadian government fail to take seriously the protection of our environment, take seriously climate change, take seriously changes to our natural resource extraction. Um, Something that's really interesting in working for a First Nation government is that you can see that change happen quickly. And um, the Hui at First Nation has taken seriously restoration and reparation of their environment, and they're trying to catch up with some of the historical malpractice that happened in the forest industry and some decisions they've made in the past that did not support the environment that keeps them alive.